Coming up on Locked On Dodgers, we'll answer some of your questions about uh, the Dodgers' current offseason plans once the lockout ends, uh, the Universal DH, and a few other things. So let's get Locked On Dodgers. You are Locked On Dodgers, your daily Los Angeles Dodgers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Dodger fans. I am Jeff Snyder of Baseball Essential, and that's Vince Samperio of Chavez Ravine Fiends. And this is Locked On Dodgers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every day. Remember, this show is free and available on all podcast platforms and on YouTube simply by searching for Locked On Dodgers. This is the daily podcast covering the Los Angeles Dodgers, bringing you the smart fans' perspective on our boys in blue. Vince, how are you doing today? Jeff, I'm doing well. We are together. Uh, I know it's rare in this offseason, but together today we have some questions to answer, and uh, it's looking good. Yeah, it should be a fun one. We got some good questions from you guys. Went for uh, quality over quantity this time. Uh, we've got four good questions, but uh, it should be a fun episode. So before we jump into that, we want to remind you, please subscribe or follow Locked on Dodgers wherever you get podcasts and or on YouTube. And when you get in your car or sit on your couch, tell your smart device to play podcast Locked on Dodgers. All right, Vince, uh, should we jump right into, into these questions? Yeah, let's get right into it. Let's go with our buddy Alejandro at Alex99. He asks, Kershaw and Bauer and we call it a winter? Yeah, half of that we call it a winter. I, I we've talked about Bauer before, um, but barring some insane new developments in what happened, I don't see Bauer returning to the Dodgers, and I do, and then obviously getting suspended by MLB. Who knows how long? So I don't think that's happening. Kershaw definitely for sure. Welcome him back. We've talked about it. Um, so it would have to be Kershaw and somebody else. I guess it wouldn't have to. But uh, more than that would be more ideal. Uh, there's not that many guys left. Carlos Rodon's the only other guy that's kind of worth anything in terms of starting pitching. That's going to be a top three starter. Everyone else is four and fives. You can go trade for a one or two from some of these other teams, but not you're going to have to give up probably a lot of assets. So I think one thing I floated in the past is Friedman maybe going in with just Kershaw letting the four or five spots or letting the five spot be flooded by all the guys they have and then attacking at the deadline to see who, what they can get. Yeah. It's uh it's interesting to see, uh, you know, the, the first part, like you said, there's no way in the world Trevor Bauer is going to be pitching for the Dodgers at the beginning of the season. Anyway, uh, they still might not have clarity. Uh, you know, maybe hopefully Rob Manfred right now, since he's not doing his job of, you know, having baseball work, Hopefully he's at least working on that investigation and, and going to uh, hand that down soon. But uh, I think it's a pipe dream to think that he's going to get off with no suspension or with time served like like uh, Jorge Soler did. Not Jorge Soler. Marcelo Zuna. Sorry, Jorge Soler. I did not mean to slander you. I think you're awesome. Marcelo Zuna, less awesome. Uh, he got off with time served, and a lot of people are pointing to that and saying, oh, well, then there's no way they're going to suspend Bauer. But – this is a different situation entirely because uh, this is the first time, as far as I know, under Major League Baseball's domestic violence policy that they have had a player being investigated for sexual assault. It's always been domestic violence. And the three elements of this policy are actually domestic violence, child abuse, and sexual assault. And so Marcelo Zuna was charged with domestic violence uh, under that portion of the policy. Uh, and so it's a totally different situation than Bauer. Uh, so Bauer is not going to be pitching for the Dodgers at the beginning of the season for sure. And yeah, it would be a, a risky, but I don't know. It, it would be an interesting approach to, to just go, you know, re-sign Kershaw and then let it ride like that and, and see what you need, see how things go and then make trades before the trade deadline. I don't know if I love that idea. Uh, that would kind of be putting a lot of pressure on the young pitchers and on the offense. Uh, I guess if they brought in Freddie Freeman and or Carlos Correa too, uh, maybe that helps on the offensive side. And so maybe they do feel more comfortable going with the, the short uh, pitching staff. But but overall, it's hard to see. 
it's hard to see the Dodgers not going after somebody, whether it is Radon or, you know, Sonny Gray or Luis Castillo from the Reds or wh- whoever it is. Uh, it seems like the Dodgers are probably going to have a big trade in them sometime between whenever this lockout ends and, you know, the, the middle of spring training. And I think the big piece of any trade right now is, I mean, we talked about it before, Gavin Lux. I think if I think he built up his value enough in the last month to where you wouldn't be trading him at lowest value. Uh, the fact that he did play some outfield also could help, you know, regardless of how well he played it. He would only get more comfortable as time goes on, you would imagine, unless he's uh, like Jock Peterson at first base, which I don't think he is. So I think that it's a matter of whoever you go out and get, I think Lux would be the main piece because they don't necessarily have anybody else that's a can't-miss prospect right now. That's At least that's a year or two away or already ready like Lux is. So I think it's just a matter of how they value him, what they think of him, and how they think the offense can happen. And obviously, if they go get somebody like Freddie Freeman or even Carlos Correa, then that makes Lux even more expendable. Yeah, unfortunately, that, that's true. I, I'm i a big Lux fan, and I do think he's going to be very good. Uh, and, and, you know, if they can get something close to reasonable value for him, you know, that it, he is expendable. For, for as good as he is, you know, he, already even without signing anybody else, there's already going to be a little bit of a crunch of, okay, where does Chris Taylor play? You know, and so it's, uh, yeah, Gavin Lux seems pretty obvious for this kind of trade. It, it scares me, honestly, to, to trade Gavin Lux. You know, I was just uh, listening to a, a podcast the other day that talks about the 1988 Topps baseball card set, and each episode they go through and uh, talk about a different card. And they were talking about Jody Reed, who at the time in 88 Tops was on the Red Sox, but later he was on the Dodgers. And uh, he got to free agency, and the Dodgers made him an offer, and he wanted to test the market, and the Dodgers got tired of waiting. And so they went out and got themselves a second baseman to replace him. And that second baseman they went and got was Delano DeShields. And <laughs> we know how they got Delano DeShields. You know, they, they traded away Pedro Martinez at – you know, relative, obviously not peak Pedro value, and uh, you know maybe didn't get as much as they would have for obviously if they'd waited till he turned into the best pitcher in baseball, they never would have traded him. But uh, you know, so really it's Jody Reed's fault that that the Dodgers traded Pedro Martinez. But you know, there's always that fear when you're trading prospects or young guys that that person is going to turn into the next Pedro Martinez, or you know, people point to Paul Canerco. I I, I didn't have as big a problem with Paul Canerco because the Dodgers got Jeff Shaw who was a very good closer, and Canerco, I don't know that he really fit on the Dodgers. He was more of a DH type. Uh, he did play some first base, but more of a DH type anyway. So, uh, yeah, but, you know, there's always that fear, and I would definitely have that fear if they trade Gavin Lux. Yeah, especially if they don't get another offensive piece and then Trey Turner does leave after the season, they don't have a shortstop of the future in that's ready to go in the next couple years. And – uh, the other one they do have is Michael Bush, who plays second base, so not shortstop. So they don't really have it set up up the middle if they don't sign a big name or keep Trey Turner. Yeah, and that's a that's a good point. It seems like they would have to either extend Turner or sign Correa or at least be confident that they're going to do one of those two things uh, before they seriously consider trading Gavin Lux. Yeah. Uh, all right, uh, that's a good question. Thank you, Alejandro, for that question. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about uh, – you know, the, the universal DH and a couple other things. So thank you for making Locked on Dodgers your first listen every day and keep it locked on Dodgers. Hey, it's the new year and that means New Year's resolutions. And if you're like most people, part of your resolutions is going to be trying to eat healthier. Well, Built Bar is the candy bar for you. Oops, did I say candy bar? That's because it tastes like a candy bar. So I get confused sometimes. If you've had a Built Bar, you'll understand my confusion because Built Bar tastes like a candy bar or maybe even better. But the difference is it's not full of crap like most candy bars are and it doesn't taste like crap like most protein bars do. It is just delicious, covered in 100% chocolate and really, really good for you. 130 calories, four or five grams of sugar and carbs, 17 grams of protein. And like I said, all covered in chocolate. You know, it's most candy bars are going to have at least 240, 300 calories and like 30 grams of sugar. You eat one of those and you are going to have to exercise for hours to get that crap off your thighs or wherever you store your fat. Well, 
Built Bar, it's not going to make you feel bad. It's not going to make you fat. It is going to make you feel good and help you stay healthy, whether you're trying to lose weight, build muscle, whatever you want to do. Built Bar is the way to go. So go to built.com and use promo code LOCKED15 and you will get 15% off your next order. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. All right, Vince, what's our next question? Our next question comes from Uncle Junior at MFNJR or Uncle JR. I don't know. One of those. But either way, should the Dodgers be in favor of the DH? That's obviously one of the topics that is going to come up in the new CBA and is supposed to be settled as universal DH. Um, That still remains to be seen for sure. But that's kind of what it seems like. Um, but yeah, Jeff, what do you think the Dodgers should be in favor? I would imagine. Yeah, the Dodgers should absolutely be in favor, uh, for a couple of reasons, partly because it's better baseball. And so everybody should be in favor of things that make baseball better. Um, <clears throat> but also the Dodgers, you know, like we just talked about the Dodgers already have borderline too many position players for lineup spots available. Uh, and they're probably not done in free agency yet. If free agency ever starts back up after the lockout, and so chances are they're going to have even more position players. And so the Dodgers are ba- basically the DH favors teams with more spending power because it's another, instead of a bench spot, you are paying for another hitter, another starter. And so the Dodgers being the team with the most money or one of the teams with the most money absolutely should be in favor of the DH because it gives them an opportunity to flex that financial muscle, uh, you know, and, and you could argue the other way because their payroll is so high. Maybe they are the team that can least afford to add another hitter to their, to their payroll with luxury tax concerns. But, uh, you know, the Dodgers aren't a team that should worry about the luxury tax, especially not the financial side. When it gets into the, the draft pick elements of the luxury tax, I can understand the baseball reasons for being a little bit tentative about that. But when it comes to when we're talking about the financial side of the luxury tax ramifications, there's no reason in the world that the Dodgers shouldn't be in favor of spending as much money as they can. Yeah, unless something drastic happens in the CBA, which I doubt it. That makes the luxury tax more than just money and more than just, like I said, before, once you get to the draft pick part, it's a little hesitant. But even then, you know, the Dodgers draft well enough to where they can afford to gamble in certain areas. Um, but, yeah, they should be in favor of DH. They, you know, we, we've talked about it a couple of times. And when they did have the universal DH, it was a little bit too late to kind of make any additions to the roster. They just kind of played it and used it as like a rotating spot. Um, if they went into the year coming out of this lockout, knowing that there's a universal DH, you know, it might change the way they attack the offseason a little bit. You know, Freddie Freeman's a good first baseman. Um, he should, they should get him regardless of universal DH or not, if they want to go after him. Um, and then, you know, Carlos Correa, same thing, but guys like maybe Nick Castellanos, they might open up to that. Kyle Schwarber, they might open up to that. You know, they might open up to guys that might be more DH reliant, probably a little bit cheaper than some of those other guys. You're only asking for the offensive production, which is why they're a little bit cheaper and they can attack it that way. And maybe, you know, that affects the way they attack starting pitching. And then, you know, it all kind of, it's all a domino effect. But at the end of the day, even if they don't add a big name that's specifically for DH, it's a good rotating spot to have for, to get whatever bat you want in the lineup. You can play matchups a little bit more. You can do a lot of things there there so yeah absolutely 100 percent in favor and you know as much fun as people might think sometimes hitters or pitchers hitting uh it's a lot fun when you got hitters hitting every single time yeah you know you bring up an in- interesting point it will be fascinating you know assuming that they do implement the universal dh which is a foregone conclusion in my mind but it was actually a foregone conclusion before for me before the 2021 season simply because both sides wanted it and i underestimated the ability of Major League Baseball and the Players Union to uh, hold a gun to their own heads and say, I'll shoot, I'll do it, I'll do it. And, uh, you know, so maybe I I shouldn't underestimate them in that way. But assuming they do have it, it'll be interesting to see what, how, how the Dodgers do approach it. Like you said, will they go after a DH type or will they, 
you know, they, they've always been a, a team that rotates players in and out of positions. And this is one that you all you have to do is own a bat. You don't even have to have any defensive skill. And so it really does seem most logical, I think, to, to say, okay, this is a position where we let guys get a day off while keeping their bat in the lineup. And I, I, I like that approach more. Uh, but even, like you said, with a Kyle Schwarber type, uh, Schwarber can play defense. You know, you could you could put him out there at first base or in left field. Uh, you know, if if you need him to play, uh, I, I don't know. You know, it seems like he would have to get at least like half of his starts at DH realistically, and I don't know if that's an approach the Dodgers would take. Uh, it'll be fascinating to see, really. Um, but li- like you said, the watching pitchers hit isn't fun. And I, I grew up a National League fan. And so deep down inside, I've always been against the DH. I have felt like National League baseball is better. But over time, I realized it's just, I think that's more just tradition and, and pride than anything else. Because the fact is, when I pay good money to go to a baseball game, I want to see baseball players doing things they're really good at. You know, I pay to watch Clayton Kershaw pitch. I don't pay to watch Clayton Kershaw hit. Although one of my favorite moments was the time Clayton Kershaw hit a ball over the wall, but those are so rare. And, and it's just, you know, Rich Hill, watching Rich, Rich Hill hit was not fun. I know people found a way to enjoy it. And, you know, uh, I'm glad to see you're on my side because usually whenever I say something like that, you say I hate fun, Vince. But uh, I mean, I do like watching Rich Hill hit, but at the end of the day, as a Dodgers fan, I, wanna, I don't want to see him hit. Yeah, I just don't even like seeing it. It's It's like... Uh, I, there's plenty of YouTube videos of people doing things they're bad at. I don't need to pay money to see it. That's that's free content. And so, yeah, get get me the, the professional hitters out there swinging the bat. And, and for me, the biggest thing that really turned my opinion was uh, people say, well, there's so much more strategy in the National League. And to the extent that's true, I think it's overblown, but to the extent that it's true, it's the strategy is – in what way do we want to make the game worse? Because, you know, when you've got uh, a tie game late in the, you know, it's the the sixth inning, it's a close game, and the pitcher spot comes up with, you know, a runner in scoring position or something. And the manager has to decide, okay, I've got my pitcher who's cruising. He's only thrown 74 pitches, but we need runs right now. And so the choice for the manager is, do I take out my good pitcher and replace him with a guy who wasn't good enough to start offensively and then replace him with a relief pitcher? Or do I let the pitcher hit even though he's bad at hitting? And so it's literally the choice is, in which way do I want to make this game worse? And uh, personally, I think uh, our goal should be to make baseball better, like I said. So, uh, you know, make baseball great again? I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. Uh, You know, baseball's always been great. Just like America has always been great. That's why it's a stupid slogan on both sides. Baseball is great, but uh, it will be a little bit greater once the universal DH is in place. Yeah, and then the other part, too, is just, you know, that you talk about the strategy, but, you know, you can, I guess. I mean, Dodgers pitchers pitch pretty deep into games for the most part last year. They're their main guys. Um, you can, you know, let them focus on pitching. You know, you risk. The Dodgers haven't really had any injuries batting wise, but there has been teams that have lost some guys batting wise. So you know, all in all, it all points to it. But I think, like we like we mentioned, the most interesting part is to see how the Dodgers attack it because this would be the first time, even though they it wasn't the full free agency, knowing that the Universal DH was going to be around, but they'll still have a somewhat you know full free agency to attack it. Where last time it was thrust on them right before the season started, and luckily. They already had enough players that were good enough to where it was never really a, a, a dark hole in the lineup. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and the flip side is I want a pitcher to pitch until he's done pitching well. I want him to come out of the game because of his pitching, not because his spot in the lineup happened to come up. So, you know, don't take away my good pitchers from me and give me more good hitters. So uh, any other DH thoughts from you? No. Um, we d- One thing we didn't mention is that Jeff Passan reported that they're supposed to talk on Thursday, MLB and MLBPA. So uh, maybe we'll have some news on Friday's episode, which would probably just be they met and they didn't come to a, a, a deal. Yeah, it depends on how much anything leaks out quickly. Obviously, they're not going to come to a deal the first time they talk in a month and a half. But hopefully it's progress and hopefully uh, hopefully it'll, it'll get them moving and 
them talking to each other is better than not talking to, to each other, which is what we've had since December 2nd. So, yeah. Uh, all right. We're going to come back in a minute. We're going to talk about Hideo Nomo and we're going to talk about $2 Tuesdays at Dodger Stadium. So thank you again for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every day and keep it Locked On Dodgers. BetOnline.ag would like to wish you a happy new betting year as we continue our march to the playoffs and beyond. BetOnline remains the number one spot for all the best sports wagering action for 2022. New year and a new updated desktop and mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code LOCKEDON to get started. From football, basketball, hockey, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games, don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for 2022. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports. Bet online, where the game starts. All right, we've got two more questions to go. Uh, our buddy Frank at to be Frank underscore seven. Uh, Frank has a little bit of a set obsession with the term ace, so I wasn't surprised when I saw this question to see that it came from Frank. Uh, I think there was probably a little bit of trolling involved because he knows that I don't like the word ace uh, simply because. We are never talking about the same thing. When, when two people are arguing about who's an ace and who's not, the answer is almost always they define the word differently. Uh, so, uh, but th- this is an interesting question anyway. He asked, was Hideo Nomo ever an ace for the Dodgers? And then he referenced a tweet of his own that where uh, Jerry Hairston Jr. had named his all-decade team for the 90s Dodgers. Apparently, this is what they're doing on Sportsnet LA right now because they're not allowed to talk, talk about any current Dodgers. So they're talking about, uh, you know, former Dodgers who aren't currently in the union. So they're allowed to talk about them. Uh, but, you know, at catcher, Mike Piazza, first base, Eric Caro, second base, the aforementioned Delano De Shields, third base, Tim Wallach, shortstop, Jose Offerman, left field, Gary Sheffield, center field, Brett Butler, right field, Raul Mondesi, and then pitcher, Hideo Nomo. And Frank says... He called him the ace of the team. And I can tell by the emojis that Frank doesn't agree that Hideo Nomo was the ace of the team. And so the question is, Vince, was Hideo Nomo ever an ace for the Dodgers? Yeah, I mean, it does go down to what you define ace as. Because the first two years that Nomo was full-time with the Dodgers, he had almost the most starts one year, the most starts the other year, and the lowest ERA on the team. So, in theory, was he the number one starter? Yes. Um, in theory, I guess if you consider the number one starter the ace of the staff, then, yeah, those first two years he could be considered the ace. Um, I didn't even realize how good his year was when he came back to the Dodgers uh, later in his career. Um, he had a 309 ERA in 33 starts. That was a year that they had... Uh, Kevin Brown, so he would technically be the ace there, depending how you define it. But yeah, I would say Hideo Nomo was the ace of a staff at some point, if you define that by being the number one starter uh, by stats. Yeah, and the only real argument I can see in those first two years of Nomo's career was the fact that Ramon Martinez was still on those teams and he pitched well in both of those years. Ramon Martinez went. 17 and 7 with a 366 ERA in Nomo's rookie year, and 15 and 6 with a 342 ERA in Nomo's second year. Uh, in 95, Nomo finished fourth in the Cy Young Award voting, and Martin- Martinez finished fifth. Um, you know, I-, I think you could make a a case, not that Martinez was better than Nomo in those two years, but because Martinez had been the ace the the few years previous it's kind of a Clayton Kershaw and Walker Bueller kind of situation uh that the Dodgers are facing right now and I know that's something Frank will relate to because that's Frank's favorite w- way to troll about aces is talking about Walker Bueller and Clayton Kershaw and uh you know if you if you say that Ramon Martinez was the Dodgers ace starting in 1990 or 91 or whenever it was uh then you have to be dethroned as the ace at some point. And was Nomo enough better than Martinez in 95 and 96 to say, okay, he's now the ace? Eh, Again, you know, that's where it comes down to, well, how do you define ace? Uh, And so uh, personally, if I was making my all 90s Dodgers team, Nomo wouldn't be the pitcher I would choose simply because those were basically Nomo's 
only two really good years. We, you know, we talked about Nomo. Uh, I don't know if we were together, if it was just me, but talking about Hideo Nomo uh, when I was talking about potential Hall of Famers uh, based on the word fame. And, you know, basically Nomo was really good in 95 and 96, and then much less good, but still adequate in 97, and then traded in 98. And so, you know, I, I'd much rather have Ramon Martinez, who pitched more for the Dodgers in the 90s and pitched more consistently and more effectively overall. For me, Ramon Martinez is clearly the pitcher I would choose for the 90s. Uh, and, and even if I went with somebody who spent less time on the team, uh, like Nomo, I probably wouldn't go with Nomo. I'd probably go with somebody who pitched better uh, later in the 90s. So, uh, yeah. So, short answer, Hideo Nomo was an ace or not, depending on how you define it, like everybody else in the world. And he wouldn't have made my list like he made Jerry's. Yeah, there you go. All right, uh, last question from at Joka Day. He asks, should the Dodgers bring back $2 Tuesdays to the right field pavilion? If you don't remember, $2 Tuesdays, I believe, was back in 2005. Um, it was $2 tickets, and it ended in what well, it ran like one week, uh, and then there was a bunch of incidents in right field pavilion, and they stopped it after that. So, yeah, I based on that, I would say no, but we can kind of shift the question to what can the Dodgers do to maybe have some kind of discounted tickets or something or what promotion, I guess, could draw in fans without causing huge issues. Yeah, and, and you know, the, the tricky part here is there in the way you asked the question, to draw in fans. The Dodgers are doing just fine drawing fans. So the Dodgers have no external motivation to do anything like this because they're leading the league in attendance every year anyway. Um, the motivation would have to be internal, like, you know, a little thing like, well, we want to make it more affordable for families to go to games so that we can build up the next next generation of baseball fans. That's the sort of thing I would be concerned about if I own the Dodgers, but baseball owners in general aren't concerned about those sorts of things. Uh, and, and I do think the Dodgers ownership uh, is reasonably kind to Dodger fans in, in a lot of ways. Uh, uh, they do, you know, more bobblehead giveaways than, than any other team in baseball. And, you know, most teams, when they do a bobblehead, they, they give away 10,000 and that's it. It's to the first 10,000 fans. The Dodgers do 40,000. Uh, and, and so it's like the Dodgers literally give away probably 10 times as many bobbleheads as any other team because they have more than twice as many bobblehead day giveaways and give away four times as many at every one of them. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's, it's a cool thing they do, but you know, I would still love to see something, it, probably not $2 Tuesdays, uh, even if we adjusted for inflation to, to $2022, you know, maybe not quite that cheap, but I would love to see some way to make it cheaper, less expensive for families to go to games and not just sitting in the nosebleed sections. You know, it's like when, when I was a kid growing up, we always sat in the left field pavilion because those tickets were always $6. It cost the same to sit in left field pavilion as it did to sit in the reserve level when I was a kid. And, uh, you know, that that's fun. Reserve uh, or the left field pavilion, it's a cool place to watch a game. You're at field level, so you feel like you've got a good view. you got a chance to get a home run. Um, and back then they didn't sell beer out in the left field pavilion. So it was kind of geared towards families. Hey, it's cheap and we're not selling alcohol. So come, you know, have a, a nice wholesome time. That was back when the pavilions were locked off from the rest of the stadium. So you couldn't get to the rest of the stadium if you were sitting in the, in the pavilion. Um, but, you know, I'd like to see them at least brainstorming some ideas to make it more affordable for families to get decent seats at Dodger Stadium. Yeah, and that's the tough part, like I said, because they have – so many because they sell so many tickets because you know unless it's a random like a random tuesday night game against uh, uh, like the marlins you know maybe that's when the pavilions don't quite fill up maybe that's when they can find a promotion out there um it has been interesting to see the pavilions turn into the cheap seats into like it, it costs more than reserve and up like top deck and everything it's like it, it used to be the cheap seats and now it's not uh it's been that's been interesting 
turn of events of but looking at if you just search two dollar tuesdays dodgers i uh, there's an la times article about it and I, i've read this article a few times <laughs> my favorite part about it is that one of the security guys said they call it fight night tuesdays now and then, <laughs> and then later on in the article it, it mentions how they asked one of the security guys like does it really make that much of a difference that they usually pay six dollars for these tickets and now they're paying two dollars and the guy said absolutely so i don't know what exactly was going on back then in 2005 when they tried it but uh yeah i would like to see last year was a weird case because you know first it was social distancing and then people hadn't gone in a year and a half and then you know tickets on the even on resale on uh, you know the third party sites last year was a little bit higher than normal you couldn't really get in for you know there would be times you could get tickets for 15 bucks and even in reserve or or even you know 20 30 bucks on the side of field field level in the corners um it, there wasn't really that market price last year so I'm sure people did get priced out, which is what, like I said, to get the families into it. You know, I've seen a lot. That's I've seen complaints about that on social media before of, you know, it costs $150 to go to a Dodger game for a family of four now, where before it used to cost, you know, they used to have those promotions where it's, you know, four tickets, four Dodger dogs and four drinks and it was like 40 bucks or something like that, or, or even adjusted more, 75, even 75 bucks. Uh, so, yeah, it. But it's just tough because they are because they have so many promotions, so many giveaways. There's not a lot of nights left where they're not getting forty, fifty thousand easily. Yeah, so it, it, it's a tricky thing, and uh, who, who knows what the answer is? But I think we can both agree, two dollar Tuesdays is probably not the answer. I mean, it would be interesting, but now that they sell alcohol everywhere, it would probably be even worse than it was back then. Yeah, and with the stadium open to everybody, like you could buy your two dollar seat and then go camp in one of those the, the standing you know tables on field level or whatever so yeah I, I think trying to limit anything to a specific section of the stadium is probably uh, out the window now with the new renovations to the stadium yeah which is good for me yep <laughs> all right you got anything else today Vince uh no this is a good one good questions that we got to talk about different things and different answers for so I like it yeah, we really appreciate all your questions. Thank you for making Locked on Dodgers your first listen every day. We'll be back tomorrow because tomorrow is a weekday and we are here every weekday. Now for your second listen today, check out Locked on Bets, your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs. Locked on Bets, hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. It's free and available on all platforms. Uh, if you're not listening to Locked on Dodgers every day, or watching it on YouTube, we would love if you'd add one or two days a week to, or a month to your rotation. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Locked on Dodgers. Vince is on Twitter at Vince Semperio. I am on Twitter at Snydog, and the DMs are open in all of those places. Our email address is LockedOnDodgers at gmail.com. And our phone number for voicemails or texts is 323-863-LOCK-5625. We are here every weekday morning, and we hope you'll be here with us. When you get in your car or sit on your couch, tell your smart device to play podcast Locked On Dodgers. And remember, you don't have to agree, you just have to listen. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one.